Well, I'm real pleased to be with you. My work is to share with God's people everywhere, the world over, what God has shared with me. And so my visit here will consist, I trust, <coughs> of sharing with you the things which are upon my heart and the things which are upon the heart of God. I'm teaching at Northeast Bible Institute. I've been there 33 years and travel all over the world every year for many years. And before doing that, one year the Lord had asked me to go aside. That was in 1951. That's when he called me to go overseas. The Lord drew me aside and I knew that he wanted me to shut myself up with him. Now in Bible school there is no peace. So I took a hotel room in Philadelphia, Robert Morris, shut myself up, told wife I wanted no interruptions. The president was not to call me president of the school and if President Eisenhower wanted me for lunch to tell him that it was not convenient, he could call some other time. That was my way of telling her I did not want to be disturbed. I was there 48 hours in fasting and prayer from Friday 2 o'clock till Sunday 2 o'clock. During all that time I had felt nothing, I heard nothing, I received nothing, there simply was nothing. <laughs> I got nowhere. I spent time before the Lord without being aware of his presence till way past midnight. I don't remember how long. I was up very in the morning before the sun rose. Didn't even bother to undress or shave or go out for a meal. They're all day Saturday like that from very early to very late. Came Sunday afternoon, I was sitting there on the floor at 2 o'clock. It happened to be 48 hours. Just then I realized that I spent 48 hours in prayer and fasting, seeking the Lord, and got absolutely nowhere. I had felt that God wanted to speak to me. He didn't speak. So as I sat there about two o'clock, in fact two o'clock sharp, I happened to know, notice, I said within my heart, my, it takes God a long time to speak. <laughs> no sooner had I said that than the reply came, <coughs> The first thing which I heard or received from God in 48 hours. And the Lord spoke in a voice right in here. Now you'll probably find me make reference to this place more than once. That's where the spirit dwells. That's where occasionally, not always, but occasionally he speaks. And in here was a voice as clear as a bell and as sharp as a razor. A voice which was not audible, making sound like I making sound now, but a voice that I heard. And the voice said in reply to my statement, to hurry God is to find fault with him. That's telling you. In other words, the Lord told me, you're finding fault with me. You're criticizing me. You think I'm too slow. 
Well, I apologized. <laughs> Asked the Lord to forgive me. And no sooner had I done that, the Lord walked through the door. I didn't see him. I did not hear him. But it was so absolutely real that sight could not have made it any realer. Now that's a butlerism. You understand? Uh, I have to make up some words that I need that Webster didn't think of. So when I do that, you have to recognize I know better but I put it that way for a purpose. And the Lord walked in at the time I sat on the floor. The Lord walked in, and behind him there followed his presence. Have you ever seen, perhaps, on TV, a regal personage I saw it recently on the news bulletin on TV uh, where they had this celebration in, in uh, Iran where the royal dignitary walked up to his throne with a long rope following behind him. If you have seen pictures like that, a royal, a regal person a uh, great king coming with a long rope behind him. Well, that's the way his presence came. As the Lord walked in, that presence, his presence, followed him like one of these regal ropes. It wasn't seen. It was clearly discerned. It was as real as you. Now, I'll be telling you some strange things before we get done Sunday. But I have a purpose in telling you this, in starting with this. <coughs> I'll tell you the purpose later. The Lord walked in and stood over to my left, approximately at arm's length, I would say, just a little bit beyond the length of my hand. Oh. And there he stood. The Lord stood there for four hours. For four hours he was teaching me out of his word on the subject of knowing God. That's what we're going to talk about. The Lord would give me a scripture, maybe something I had never observed. I'd look it up, I would read it, and oh, the thing began to unfold, and I would see the, the beauty, the content of a given verse. Last summer, I was in Bangkok, Thailand, and walked along the street, when to my great delight I saw a beautiful lotus flower lying on the side of the road. Don't ask me how it got there. I can only figure somebody had a bunch of lotus for some banquet or something and uh, 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 one dropped off. There was the lotus. And I'm very fond of the lotus. I opened it up it destroyed it, really. I knew it would, but I wanted to see the inside again. And I opened up that lotus, pulled the petals back, and oh, what beautiful petals, a wine color like red white, and looked in there and, uh, uh, and delighted myself in that beautiful arrangement of the lotus within. Well, that's what the Lord did with the scriptures. He gave me a scripture, and he'd open it up, so to speak, and let me look on the inside, and that, as I said, lasted for uh, four hours till six o'clock. 
I'll give you the whole story, then I'll come back again. I told you the subject had to do with knowing good. At the time, I didn't know, but now I know that that was to be my major subject as I would travel for the Lord throughout all the years, I've done it 20 years now, or a little bit over, things that are very near to the heart of God, things that he wants his people to know, and that knowing God involves the knowledge and the personal experience of the, of the presence of God, the manifest presence of God. And I'll be leading toward that, especially tomorrow, tonight. We sort of have to get started in, just put our foot a little bit within the door. I'll go on with the afternoon now on Sunday, then I'll come back. At six o'clock, the Lord turned. I could tell when he turned. The Lord turned, faced the door that was behind me, and as he turned, he spoke again, right in here, and said, and the Lord left him to try him. With that, his presence followed him. Now I had admitted something. As he came in, with a presence, his presence following him like a, 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 a rope of a sovereign that drags along behind as they mount the steps to the throne. When he had arrived there, that presence spread out and went through the entire room of that hotel. It was as real as real could be. And as I stood there, I said within myself, now his presence fills every cubic inch of this room. I believe without any question that God gave me an experience similar to that of Isaiah when he said in Isaiah 6 and his train filled the temple. Now that train is not a choo-choo train. It's not a Washington Miami Express. That train is generally believed to be the effervescence of his glory. And apparently Isaiah saw the manifest presence of God throughout the throne room. And so he said, and his train filled the temple. And this presence that also was like a, well, like a, uh, a rope, also filled the entire room. And I knew every cubic inch is now filled with that presence. Now later on, tomorrow sometime, we'll differentiate between the omnipresence and the manifest presence, but we are not ready for that. I have to lead you step by step so that we can just plunge into it. We have to lay a foundation. So the Lord said right in here, and the Lord left him to try him. As he turned, he went out, and that presence collected from all over the room. This is a bit hard to explain, as though well, it just collected from all over the room and followed him out of the room like the rope of one of these mighty kings. He went out and this presence like a rope followed behind him. My, that was something. Four hours of 
personal teaching from a personal Christ and the true knowledge of God. I didn't know that later he would send me into all the world. He has put my feet in more than a hundred countries and some of them so often I couldn't even tell you how often. I didn't know that. But here he began to give me the essence of subject matter very dear to his heart. So the Lord left him to try him. I thought, that sounds to me like something is going to happen. <laughs> well, in school, you know, we teach and then you have a test. And I thought, it looks to me, the Lord's been teaching me and he has decided there will have to be a test. There was all right. Now before I get into that, I want to tell you something. I will choose my words most carefully. I will be as accurate as I know how. And everything I tell you is the absolute, unembroidered truth. I say that because it might strain the credulity of some of you. So I say beforehand, it is the truth. I thought something is going to happen. I had no idea what. Nothing happened. I got up, walked around. I thought I might as well go to bed. It was eight o'clock. I had slept very little since Friday. And I thought I'll go to bed. And as I did, lo and behold, Satan walked into that room. He came through the door, didn't open it, just came through the door as though the door wasn't there. I recognized him at once. He walked in precisely the same way the Lord had walked in, step by step. He came in and behind him there followed the satanic presence like the regal rope of some sovereign that you have seen perhaps on TV. I've seen her with Queen Elizabeth. That long flowing rope. I don't know 10, 12 feet behind them. It just ran the alone. Well, that rope followed Satan. Not a rope, but the satanic presence followed behind him like such a regal rope. You see, not only is the Lord royalty. Satan is also a mighty ruler. He is the ruler of all the world today. He has the whole world under his control, minus God's children, but we won't go into that. He is a regal man of tremendous power. So he had that rule. And he stood precisely where the Lord stood. I was not sitting now, I was standing by the bed. They had these four posted beds that I hate, and I stood by one of the posts. And Satan walked in and stood precisely where the Lord stood. And as he stood, that robe-like presence, satanic now, spread throughout the whole room exactly the way the Lord's presence had done it. Precisely. It was a garbage copy. And I stood there and I said within myself the satanic presence is now filling every cubic inch of this room. I could tell without any question there's no question about it, however difficult it might be for some of you to accept it. The satanic presence filled that room. I stood by the post, Satan stood. 
where the Lord stood. No, I was not afraid. No, I wasn't afraid. I'm not aware that I had any fear. He opened the debate. See that? He spoke. And started with, the Lord did not visit you. And I answered out loud. Now, his voice was not audible like mine. And yet it was a clear, distinct voice that I heard, but it wasn't a natural voice. You see, Jesus had the same thing. But I heard him. It was a spiritual voice. There is such a thing as spiritual sound. Uh -huh. As spiritual hearing. I declare to you there is such a thing as spiritual color and spiritual form. I even believe there is spiritual weight and the hand of the Lord was heavy upon him. But uh, we'll get into that uh, maybe tomorrow. Well, we better get into it tomorrow. For now, here came that voice. The Lord did not visit you. And I said out loud, yes, he did. No, he didn't, <laughs> came the reply. I said, yes, he did. Now, I cannot give you all the things in the right sequence. I can guarantee that. I, I remember quite well the beginning. Much of it I have forgotten. Some of it is not in the right sequence. But the picture I'm giving you is correct. And I think the second one was, I know it was, and I think it was the second one. This Bible is not the Word of God. I said, yes, it is. The Lord didn't teach you. Yes, he did. And he went on something like, why don't you deny God? I said, why should I? Well, because God isn't a real God. I said, he sure is real, I know he is. Well, you're not even saved. I know I am. Why don't you, de don't you deny this word? Why should they? It's the word of God. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. And so the thing got quite animated. Oh, he said, among other things, I forgot a lot. Um... You are praying too much. I said, no, I'm not. You are going to finish your life in an insane asylum. I said, no, I won't. <laughs> yes, you're going to lose your mind because you're praying too much. I said, I'm not praying too much and I'm not losing your mind. Now, here is where I forgot a number of things. I cannot tell you how long this lasted. I don't know. And he said, you are losing your mind already. I said, I'm not. He said, you are so, see? <laughs> and with that, things began to happen. The room, I still stood by the bed, the room started to turn. Brother. <laughs> I was the center of a merry-go-round. The dresser, the bathroom door, the walls, everything started to go like a merry-go-round. And it went faster and faster, and I would say it went something like this speed. Now, this is an approximation, maybe a little faster. The whole room going around. And he said, see? I said, no, I don't. This is only a delusion. Nothing is moving. You're only trying to deceive me, make me believe it is moving, but it isn't. Yes, it is, and the thing went faster. <laughs> but I'll tell you that was serious. And I began to see something. Now you're losing your mind. I saw triangles in the air, triangles, circles, squares, trees, Rocks, mountains, everything moved throughout the room. 
lucents, all kinds of things in one great confusion, and the whole thing went around, and I stood in the middle, and he said, Are you ready to deny God? No, and I won't be. Well, you better, and so on he went up. And I held my ground. I never budged. He tried to get me to deny everything the Lord had taught me, and I wouldn't deny it. All of a sudden, he turned, started to go through the door, I could tell step by step. As he did, the whole satanic presence all over the room collected and followed him like the regal rope of a royal dignitary. That rope again followed him out of the room. And I was left alone. My, I thought that was something. Now you have no idea what that thing was. The, the, the dreadfulness of it. I had the strangest feeling he was going to come back. Then I fussed about the room and I noticed it was 10 o'clock, but I, I cannot tell you how thing the last. I fussed around the room for a while and dressed at the bed, what have you. I, I, I better not even guess the time. At 10 o'clock I thought, well, certainly it's time to go to bed. I had been up since about, I'm not sure, but let's say about 4 o'clock. And I was just going to take my coat off. In walked Satan the second time. He came in, that presence followed him like the regal robe of a royal dignitary. He stood in the same place, that presence spread out, filled the entire room, and I knew that for the second time, the entire room was filled with the satanic presence. There was one thing that I noticed. This time, everything seemed to be very much stronger. He said the same words. The whole thing was a carbon copy of the first visit. I don't think it varied in one detail, not that I could recognize. We went through the whole thing. The Lord didn't visit you. Yes, he did. And uh, why don't you deny this and that and the other? Same thing. But one difference. There was such power coming from that being now that wasn't there before. The first one was powerful, but this one was super powerful. When he spoke, are you ready to give up? There came with that an authority. That was frightening. I don't think I was frightened. I'm not aware of it. But I sure recognized that this time I was in trouble. I knew it. And uh, are you ready to deny the word? Are you ready to deny God? You are losing your mind. And then the room, everything went around again. You are losing your mind. You are finishing your life in an insane asylum and all the rest the same. And then the appeal, are you ready to surrender? Said, no, I'm not ready and I won't be. I took my stand firm, but I noticed somewhere inside of my will, I was weakening. And that's what worried me. I could tell my answers were no longer as resolute as they were the first time. There was such a persuasive, overwhelming power coming from that being. It weakened my will. I wanted to, and I could. My answers became less and less resolute. And he pounced on me with his words with 
without mercy. There is no mercy in the devil. Are you ready? Will you deny? Will you do so and so with power? Said, no, I won't. But there was not that ring there was at the first. That categorical refusal. My will was weak. And I thought to myself, if he does not let up soon, he is going to win. I didn't say that. I thought it. He kept hammering away for me to give up and to give in. I resisted, but my resistance weakened. I imagine he knew it. And he kept pressing until I had no more will to resist. I wanted to, but didn't have the will. My mind wanted to, but my will didn't have the power. I can't explain it any better. I became completely exhausted, not only physically, but what I thought was worse in my will. I stood by the bed, now, I do not remember whether I said audibly or simply silently within myself what I'm telling you now. I said, but I think just within myself, I cannot resist anymore. I might have said it out loud. I think it was only inside. And with those words, I threw myself on the bed completely finished. I could no more stand. I could no more talk back. I had it. I was through. I cannot resist anymore and throw myself on the pit in seeming defeat. And he stood there. Just as I struck the bit, I felt something in here. It felt like the size of an orange, middle-sized. That's the only way I can put it. Now, there was no orange there. I knew it was the presence of the Spirit of God. I know that presence. I felt that presence in here just about the size of a medium-sized orange. Somehow, as far as I remember, I now became, I now concentrated on this thing in here and ignored Satan, though I knew he still stood there, he was there, but apparently, as far as I recall, he bothered no more. That presence was there and it, it expanded slowly and this presence sang. The Holy Ghost sang in here. I heard him sing. I didn't sing. He sang. And I heard him sing that chorus. Isn't he wonderful, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful? Isn't Jesus my Lord wonderful? He sang that. And as he sang it, it his presence got larger and it slowly moved upward and sang again, isn't he wonderful? And I listened, and presumably he listened too. <laughs> nothing went on, he said nothing, I was occupied with this. And it started again, isn't he? And finally this presence reached my throat. Now, uh, you say, Brother Buell, I explain it. I, I, I can only relate it. That presence reached here, and it still sang. And when it reached here, I joined. And we sang. The Spirit and I sang a duet, presumably for His Majesty the Devil. <laughs> He had nothing to say, at least he didn't say anything to me. And we sang. I sang out while the Spirit sang in his own And we sang, it just started over, I had just joined him, 
is it lying on the bed? Isn't he wonderful? I got as far as the F, or we got as far as the F. When the spirit stopped, broke off the song, and I with it, and he spoke. And said, and I got it a little bit different from the way it is in the Bible. I can't help that. Uh, I remember Paul quoted some scripture in the New Testament differently from the way it is in the Old Testament. And if we get into it, I don't know if we get the time, I'll give you a reason for it. The Lord let me in on that one here. And the Spirit spoke and said, When the enemy shall come in like a flood, and here is the difference. Then the Spirit shall raise an armed defense against him. And with that, Satan turned and went out of that room just like this, that presence is simple, and out it went. And he was gone. And the glory of the Lord filled the entire room. Amen. I was free, the Spirit came to my defense, I was defeated, I couldn't stand up against them. But at that moment I got assistance from the Holy Ghost. And as I said, the glory of God filled that room, I looked at my watch and now I saw it had become midnight, so it took quite a while. Next day I went back to school with a new experience. Now you might wonder, and rightly so, but what was the whole thing about? Well, for four hours, as I told you, the Lord had been teaching me things about the knowledge of God, His personalized presence, the secrets of his presence. Now, this is a subject for which I should have with you an entire week. We, I can only take you into this thing a little bit, but enough, I hope, to make your mouth water uh, and, uh, uh, and seek the Lord. I just want you to know there's lots more than what I'm able to give you. And as I said, I didn't know at that time that the Lord would send me overseas. I think, though I don't know this, but I think the devil either knew it or had an inkling. And the reason he tried to throw me was that this truth of the knowledge of God, the reality, the secret of his presence, might not be taught throughout all the earth. He wanted to rob me. He wanted to destroy the very thing which the Lord had given me because that's one thing the devil hates. He does not want people to know God. So important is this truth to God to his people and to Satan. It's important to Satan in the sense that he does not want God's people to have the personal manifest presence of God in their lives. But Satan, thou challenging fiercely, lost the debate because of the faithful intervention of the Spirit of God. Now then, it is some of these things that Satan sought to destroy that I want to share with you while I'm with you. Just a few of them, as I said. There's lots more, but we'll do what we can. Uh, I believe with all my heart, if I had succumbed to Satan, 
the Lord would have never sent me overseas. Never. And Satan had an inkling, I think, if not complete knowledge, and did everything he could to destroy him. We had a revival in our school in 51. Were you there, Brother Young? You weren't there. I don't suppose anybody else was there at that time. Well, that is where God began to put into execution these things. Uh, we had a Friday night service, and had quite a move of the Spirit, but some of the students carried things too far. I was in charge, and I put my hand and those fellows with their manifestations, they went to excess. But in doing so, I did it in a carnal spirit. And as soon as I did it, all moving of the spirit stopped. And I knew I killed the meeting. It was a step as though I blight had struck that meeting. I knew it was finished. So I dismissed it. We went home. But I knew I wrecked the meeting. That night, during that revival incidentally, the Lord awakened me every morning at 2.30 on the dot. And that meant that I had to stay up the rest of the night sitting in his presence to be ready for the services. The Lord would give me the whole outline for a service. And for every meeting, the Lord let me know beforehand what he was going to do. It was amazing. I wish we had time, but I can't give you any more. That night at 2.30, the Lord woke me again. And I was awakened by a man's voice singing audibly in my bedroom. Now, wife didn't hear it, but I heard it. It wasn't for her, it was for me. I was awakened by a man singing. And the voice reminded me of the voice of Lawrence Tippett. I don't know if any of you have heard his singing. I am, well, all right, fine. It reminded me of his voice. And the Lord sang, oh, I awakened with the song, and looked in the direction of the voice, and saw the Lord standing there with my eyes. And I'll take you into the scriptures with these things. We're just getting our feet wet tonight. And tomorrow morning we're going to move into the Word and I'll show you these things related to the Word. He stood there, full size, dressed in white garments, looking my way, keeping on singing. I heard him like I'd hear a man's voice. I saw him like I see you. I suppose the distance was something from here to this man here. He stood by the window. And I sat up in bed spellbound. Wouldn't you? <laughs> he sang two stanzas. I was awakened, apparently, as he, just as he began the first stanza. The first stanza had to do with sin and forgiveness. He started another stanza, same tune, that had to do with grace, forgiveness, and glory. And when he finished his song, suddenly he wasn't there. But oh, what presence. And I knew it was time, I knew it was time to get up. So I sat there, had a chair ready for these uh, times, 
sat there waiting before the Lord. Oh, what presence. And I kept musing over this song and that the Lord sang for me. By the way, that has happened only once in my lifetime, so don't think that's a regular thing. It is not. It was only once. There have been other experiences, but this kind, only once. And um, in turn, at the beginning of the revival, the Lord told me that the success of the revival will depend upon my instantaneous, unquestioning obedience. If I had time, I'd like to tell you some things about that revival. I don't think you've heard the light, but I mustn't indulge. I must get to the knowledge of God. Tomorrow morning, we'll start with the uh, scripture voice. And uh, I recognized I, am, I was mulling over the second stanza. And in my spirit, I, I seemed to push away the thought of the first stanza that had to deal with sin, mainly. Pushed out of the way. I didn't like that one. And when I realized that I was pushing that thing away, I was frightened. I thought, why do I want to push that away? What's the reason? And I got suspicious of my own self. And I said, Lord, is anything wrong? And I got the answer at once. The answer was the error of Yusa. You remember Yusa in the Old Testament? He touched the ark of God and he got killed. And when the Lord said the error of user, I knew what he meant. You committed the same sin as user. You touched the ark of God. Now I didn't die because somebody else died 2,000 years ago in my place. But it was sin nevertheless. I said, Lord, I'm so sorry. I really didn't mean to. Well, he knew that. User didn't mean to either. I said, I don't know what I can do. Whew. And at once I got the answer. On Sunday morning during the communion service, I want you to stand up and make, uh, make a public confession to the whole student body for what you have done at that meeting and ask the students forgiveness. Well, I squirmed when I heard that. <laughs> I said, but Lord, it's the students that do the confessing, not the teachers. They just listen. <laughs> but uh, he didn't listen to my rationalization. I knew he meant it, and I knew there was no way out. I said, Lord, I don't see how I can do a humbling thing like that, but you know you'll get me sooner or later, so, Lord, uh, I believe I will, but right now I won't. <laughs> well, you know the Lord understands. And Sunday morning came, we were just giving out the bread. My heart suddenly began to pound. Ooh, it pounded. I thought he was going to jump out fast. Oh, this thing. I know what it was. It's the signal. Now is the time. <laughs> <laughs> and I stood up. Somebody else had communion. and they gave it to somebody because I, everybody knew I was so terribly tired. They wanted to give me a rest. I was sitting down among the boys. And I stood up. They were giving out the bread, and in the middle of it, I stood up. Now was the time. Well, God knows. I stood up. I said, students, I have a confession to make. Whew. You could have heard a pin drop. The silence, and I could hear their thoughts. Brother Butler. <laughs> Next turning, stretching, looking back. I came out with him, told him exactly what happened, and I said, I want to ask your forgiveness for having killed the meat. No sooner had I finished that word 
one of the boys jumped to his feet, gave a powerful utterance in prophecy. I won't give you all of it. I'll give you some of it. I remember most. I don't even remember all. But I don't give you all I remember. Because thou hast done this thing, it was obviously addressed to me, and hast humbled thyself, in the sight of this congregation. Therefore the Lord thy God will lift thee up above thy fellows and make thee a city set on a hill. When I heard that, I broke. I dropped down between the seats and whipped. As I did, the Lord spoke, right, right in here, as clear as a bell, as sharp as a razor, saying, Go and teach all nations. That's where I got my call to go overseas. And if I had not humbled myself that morning, I do not believe God would have ever sent me to carry these truths that Satan was challenging. And I'll take you into some of them. In fact, what I'm giving you here is actually the exhibition of the, of the knowledge of God and the ways of his presence. Well, teach all nations. <laughs> Where would I go? With what? Bible school teachers don't have salaries, especially in those days. We were as poor as a church mouse. Even a church mouse could have felt a millionaire. Me go traveling. Me? Where to? With what? A few weeks later, the Lord spoke. Go get a passport. I said, Lord, you're funny. <laughs> I don't need the passport. What for? I'm not going any place. I have no money to go with. Go get a passport. Oh, no. I wouldn't get it. Lord spoke a third time, uh, several days in between. Go get a passport. I almost did. And I said, really, Lord, this is silly. I'm not going any place. Why well, spend money for a passport? I'm not going. So I dropped it. About two weeks later, in one of the churches, a lady walked up to me. She never did that before nor since, and said to me, out of the blue, Brother Butler, do you have a passport? <laughs> I said, why no, why should I have a passport? Oh, she says, I'm sorry to hear that. And then she, and then she reached for something in her purse. Now all I have here is an outline. I left my plane ticket at the hotel. She said, I have an airplane ticket for you to go to Europe with. I said, well, 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 what is this? She said, this is a ticket on a chartered flight to Europe. We cannot get a refund, but we are allowed to give it to somebody else. She said, as something came up, I cannot go, and I felt God would have me give you this round trip ticket free of charge. But she said, you got no passport. Oh, I said, I'll get one right away. No, you won't, she said. It takes four weeks to get a passport. It did then, it doesn't now. It takes four weeks to get a passport. This flight leaves in two. She says, I'm sorry, and put the ticket back and went away. Would you like to know what I did? <laughs> Would you? I stayed home. But did I feel bad? I missed it. I missed it. And God, this was spring, and God didn't talk to me anymore about traveling for nine months. Not a word. He didn't say boo. I'd say, God, when's the time to go? Not a word. <laughs> came near Christmas time I began to feel now it's time to go again well I mustn't 
uh, take too long. Uh, I was looking for somebody to give me a ticket. <laughs> a ticket. Somebody wake up or walk up and shake hand, you know, praise the Lord, Brother Feudal, and I felt like saying, well, praise the Lord, uh, but, 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 but where's the ticket? <laughs> I felt like saying, I said that in myself, not to the people, where's the ticket? There's no ticket. However, I got a passport, the Lord bore witness. That was the thing to do. But nobody gave me a ticket. And, uh, but word got around, I had to ask the night school for permission to, uh, not to teach a week, and in the day school too, they had to give me permission, so word got around. It was Christmas day. One brother walked up, he said, Brother Butner, how are you going? Well, I said, by boat. My boat is at man, you're only gone, I forgot now, oh, you're only gone two weeks, or a little over two weeks, something like that, Christmas vacation. He said, why, you go by boat, you haven't got enough time, you hardly get there when you have to turn around. Well, I said, there's only one reason, air is too expensive. Well, he said, how much would that cost? Oh, I said, I don't know. He said, next Monday night, you let me know what airfare would cost, and I'll pay the difference. And he did, I went by air. We were halfway across the Atlantic. I was watching a star up there, and suddenly the Lord spoke. Right in there. Clear as a bell, sharp as a razor, saying, I have sent thee on a journey. I was thrilled. Oh, I was in the will of God. I have sent thee on a journey. Well, I didn't know where to go, so I went home to my folk in Germany. I'm German, you can tell that. And I didn't know what the Lord wanted me to do. I figured, well, my mother is unsaved, she is sick, and the Lord perhaps wants me to talk to her, which I did. But my sister, she's Baptist, and she said, I told our pastor you were coming. He wants to know if you give him a service. I told her that you were Pentecostal, and she didn't know whether I'd go to a Baptist church. <laughs> she didn't know I'd go to any church. <laughs> if only the Communist Party of Moscow would invite me for a week of Bible studies, I gave them the knowledge of God, I'd go. <laughs> hey, I told that somebody up at school the other day, one of the teachers, and you, he said, you would? I said, sure thing. So I said, sure, I'd be glad to. Fine. Lord woke me up very, very early, gave me a message, preached it. A Baptist church. Oh, real, sedate. Pastor said, could you come back tomorrow night? I said, sure, do that. Lord woke me up in the morning, early, gave me a message. And I'd sit there a couple hours. That's what does it, you know, that's a secret. And that went on for a week. Sunday morning, he said, now before you speak, I want to talk to my people. Oh, oh, I thought, here we go. Now he's going to cancel everything. I was talking on the, the, the things of the Spirit. And he said to them, he said, I want to let you know that for many months I have been praying that God would give us Baptists truth of the deeper things of the knowledge of God. And he, then he started to cry. My sister said that's the only time they ever saw him weep. He said, just think, God sent a man from America to answer my prayer. While that was going on, the Lord had something up his sleeve. <laughs> he said to me one day in the morning, not in a voice, no, nope, not this time, the words just stood there in my consciousness vivid. Exactly as I'm telling you, go to Amsterdam, the, I was in Germany, on New Year's Day, about the middle of the afternoon by air. Exactly as I'm telling you, not a word changed. Nothing. 
I said, Lord, New Year's Day is a holiday. I want to spend New Year's Day with my mother. Hadn't been there for so many years. Here it came, here it stood again. Go to Amsterdam. A New Year's Day. About the middle of the afternoon. By air. Same thing. I said, Lord, I have never been in Amsterdam. I have no interest in Amsterdam. I want to stay with my mother for New Year's Eve. That's something special in Germany. And the Lord spoke a third time. Now I say spoke, not words. Just the words stood there in my mind someplace. And I knew what they were. Well, they were clear. I heard nothing, but there they were, standing out in my consciousness. I was just going to tell the Lord I wasn't going when I remembered, go get a passport. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Butler, are you going to miss God again? So I made up my mind, I'm going to go. Went to Stuttgart, where I'd have to fly from, and went to Swiss Airlines. I asked about a flight on New Year's Day about the middle of the afternoon. They said, sir, we have no flight. All right, thank you. I went over to KLM. <coughs> they said, that's a holiday. There is no air service between Stuttgart and Amsterdam on any holiday, and especially New Year's Day. Yes, sir, you mean nothing's going to Amsterdam? Absolutely nothing. My oh, brother, I was in trouble. I've done a lot of teaching on divine guidance, and now I was stuck. I stepped out on the sidewalk in rain, snow, wind, a mixture of miserable. I stood there, shut my eyes, and spoke to God. I said, Father, do you know the airline schedules or don't you? <laughs> there was no answer. And I was almost in panic. I thought, how can I ever open my mouth again and teach people on knowing the will of God if I make a boo-boo like that? I thought, what can I do? Oh, I thought, I'll go over to the American Express Company, see what they say. And I'll never, never forget that Oh, oh I'm sorry. i never forget that man. He had to stick schedule book, there's no book around, I guess, uh, big schedule book on outline, on, on uh, air schedules, and he went through that book back and forth. He said, when did you want to do? <laughs> New Year's Day. Oh, no. You said New Year's Day? I said, yes. You mean uh, about the middle of the afternoon? I said, yes. He said, my, you are lucky. There is a special flight going from Stuttgart to Amsterdam non-stop at 4.10 p.m. He said, how will that suit? And when he said that, the spirit bore witness in here strong that I said, that's it, that's it, that's it. Got all excited. <laughs> Got my ticket. They came, went to Amsterdam. I had no idea what I was to do there. Stood at the airport, I said, Father, I have arrived in Amsterdam, now what's up? <laughs> not one word, not even boo. I said, Father, this is Amsterdam, Schiphol Airport, and I've arrived. <laughs> what was I supposed to tell? I stood like a fool. <laughs> I said, Father, if you don't tell me what to do, I'm going into the city, look for a hotel, and check in, and tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'm going to London. I had to go there anyway. Went, I got nothing, went to the city, looked around, park hotel, stuck my nose in a bit, looked all right. Almost any of those hotels are tops in Europe. Oh, they got the hotels. 
Oh, believe you me. Well, never mind. Before I went to bed, I said, Father, I've checked in now. What do you want? In other words, I was so frustrated. I said, Father, I'm going to tell you something. Unless you tell me something between now and tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, I'll be out at the airport going to London. I was up early. I said, Father, I'm still in Amsterdam. Not a word. All right. Out I went. Sat on the British European Airways flight at 8 o'clock, ready to take off. That plane didn't take off. We waited about 15 minutes and oh, was it cold. Here came an announcement. Will all passengers please return to the airport lounge? There is a heavy fog settling over the airport. It is too dangerous to take off. That's exactly what they said. <sighs> Everybody was glum. You know how that is. We went in, and as I walked through the door, suddenly there was the enveloping presence of God. Ooh, what a presence. Within, without, I seemed to be in a cloud of God's presence. And I thought, uh-oh, here it is. And I got the spirit of prayer and worship. All I wanted was find a place to sit down. So I poked around. Walked around and I, I found a, I found a nice chair in the corner. I hope you have these papers so the lights can come back. <laughs> I found a nice comfortable chair and sat down in that corner and just sat there. And inside, presence of God would just rise up in a combination of worship and prayer. I kind of lost track of things. It was an intense presence. Finally, I thought maybe I ought to see what's going on with the weather. To my shock, it was one o'clock in the afternoon and I had been sitting there all that time. My thought has the plane left. Walked over there, the fog was so heavy, so thick, that of the nearest planes, and they were right outside some of them, you could only see the barest outlines. And then I heard that they canceled all flights, nothing was coming in, nothing going out, nothing was expected to move for the rest of the day. And I stood there, in front of me stood two men. One man apparently worked at the airport, the other appeared to be a passenger. The airport man said to the passenger, we don't understand this fog. There is no fog anywhere in this general area except right over this airport, nowhere else. He says, we can't understand it. At first I thought nothing of it. Later on I began to see. Well, I thought something's wrong. Surely the Lord wouldn't have me waste all this time. It's expensive, you know. And I stood there and figured out how many hour, how many dollars I was wasting per hour <laughs> while sitting there at the airport doing nothing. I actually figured out what I was wasting. Well, could I do? The presence left. I felt so empty. So confused, so alone, I said, something is wrong. I failed the Lord somewhere. I walked around, and there was a long table, dining room table, like a long thing. Nobody was sitting there. They just had these stiff upright seats. Nobody chooses them, you know. And I walked over and sat down at the corner of that table. Now you have to follow my details. They're not superfluous. I sat there. Wondering where I made my mistake. As I sat there, I looked to my left. And here came a man in a black suit. And that was an unusual man. The man walked so erect, yet not stilted. His steps, his bearing, 
was so regal. And a good looking man he was. And I thought, who can that man be? Oh, I thought, he must be one of the royal families of Europe. His whole bearing had a regal something about it. And that man sat down right in front of me, opposite me. Well, I paid no more attention to him. I was worried. I'm getting tired. I'll, I'll be done, sir. I closed my eyes and I spoke to God. In my heart, I said, Father, where am I? What I meant was, where am I? I was confused. I seemed to have lost the way. Where am I? And for no reason that I can explain, I looked at this man. At that very moment, he lifted the book from his lap. I don't think I had noticed the book. He lifted the book from his lap, opened it up as though he wanted to read. And I saw the title of the book, which said, I am leading you where you do not want to go. The man closed his book and put it back on his lap as though he had changed his mind, and I had my answer from God. A waiter came along and said, Will you two gentlemen please move? We need this table to feed some passengers. I went this way. The man with his book walked that way. I looked after him. And I stood for a moment and said to myself, Who could that man be? What an unusual man. So good looking so regal, so cultured. Now you can believe what you want. But since that incident, the Lord has borne witness to me twice, once publicly, once privately, that that man was none other but the angel of the Lord, whom God had sent to the airport to bring me back into his will. You can do with that what you like. Your disbelief doesn't change the fact. So I went my way. There was no chair to be found anywhere. Walked walking around, walking around, looking for a seat. Oh, I apologize. Ask the Lord to forgive me. The presence came back. Oh, what a presence. All I wanted was to sit down, but my chair was taken. I spied one chair. Nice, comfortable chair, a little round table this diameter, a Negro man sitting on one side, opposite was empty. I quickly sat down before somebody else got it, shut my eyes, and let my spirit go up to God. By the way, I so enjoy your worship. That's worship. Let my spirit go up, and this man interrupted me. I heard him say, Sir, tell me your secret. I opened my eyes, found him leaning across the table, and I said, What secret? He said, Sir, I have been watching you sitting over there in that chair all morning. He said, I've been sitting here and I kept watching you. He said, what was that light on your face? I said, what light? He said, I don't know. But you had a light on your face. And he said, I wondered to myself, saying, I wonder if that man has what I am seeking. <laughs> so he said, sir, if you have what I am seeking, Will you please tell me your secret? Well, I was dumbfounded. I said, but what are you seeking? He said, I am a businessman from East Africa, and he was cold black. I was brought up in the Mohammedan faith. But he said, Mohammed never gave me peace. He said, I need my sins forgiven, and I don't know how to get them forgiven. He said, I want true peace. 
He said, I've tried different religion. I became a Catholic. But he said, I didn't find what I needed. I became a Protestant. I tried different Protestant churches, he said. But he said, I didn't find what I needed. Then I said, I gave up all religions. And for many years, I have prayed every day one prayer. Oh God, if there is a God, show me the way to true peace. And then he said, sir, do you know the way to true peace? If you tell me, won't you tell me your secret? In the meantime, the Lord had put here what I should say. And now I gave him the story of my own conversion in New York when I looked for peace. And there it was my privilege to point this man to Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, in the middle of this very busy shipful airport in Amsterdam. Now then, the fog had been so thick only about an hour before Nothing moved. And now I finished my testimony. And for the second time, I'll be done right away. And for the second time, I said, use this scripture, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. But I am. We are leaving in ten minutes because the fog is lifting. And I finished my verse. And we said goodbye. God saw this man praying in East Africa. He had come from Nairobi. So God in his providence brought this man to Amsterdam. In the meantime, he brought Butler from New York to Germany. Gave me the time in which I should go to Amsterdam. And it was that we were there on the same day and God shut the airport down with a fog to answer that man's prayer. And when I lose the way, he sent his angel to get me back. He brought us together in that busy, at that busy airport. And as soon as the testimony was given, God lifts the fog and the planes are flying. He went his way. And I made, 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 and I went my way. This is some of the outworking of the true personal knowledge of God. That is the kind of truth that works. Satan had tried to destroy them. It was saved through the intervention of the Spirit. And if we will allow ourselves to be led into this area of the manifest presence of God and the true knowledge of good, there are experiences for us in God where the same scripture would be fulfilled that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. I have not seen neither hath the ear heard what God has prepared for them that love him. That's a quotation from Isaiah where it reads, I has, I has not seen, neither hath the ear heard what God has prepared for him that waited for him. And if we will give ourselves to God and his word, we have never seen, we have never heard, we have never imagined the experiences are waiting for us in the presence of God. That's all for tonight. Tomorrow morning, we'll go into the word. But this is the word demonstrated. Lord bless you. Good night.